Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Dominic King. I'm a sports medicine and interventional orthopedic physician at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna discuss several pearls related to the minimally invasive synonymy procedure. Uh, for me, this is a very satisfying procedure to perform, uh, but with all procedures, uh, the best method for success is in the preparation. So let's jump in and get started and let's talk about that. So if you asked, what are the best pearls that we could offer uh, regarding this uh, procedure? Uh, in other webinars, you've uh, heard us discuss uh, how we classify tendons, why we even use this procedure, and sometimes why we don't choose to use this procedure because we have uh, some other things that we uh, obviously attempt first uh, with physical therapy, counter force bracing, and one, just being able to know what the tissue looks like. Uh, but here's what, what uh, we would say. Number one, uh, you, you have to understand musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, whether that training comes hands-on by you just putting that device on patients uh, in the office, uh, even if you're not charging them for it, just being able to get an understanding of what their tissue looks like. Use the musculoskeletal ultrasound like a orthopedic stethoscope. Get an understanding of what the tissue on your patients look like when they present with different types of findings. You can learn so much, uh, especially if you already have imaging. If you had the, an MRI of a patient who has uh, a rotator cuff tear or for the elbow that we're gonna be uh, talking about uh, today, common extensor tendon, and they come in with an MRI. You already know what that looks like, toss an ultrasound on and just be able to compare that anatomy. Uh, most people will say it takes around 50 to 150 evaluations to really get good at picking up and being good in diagnostic. I certainly think if you know how to do an ultrasound guided injection and from a sub-millimeter positioning, you know where the tip of that needle is, you absolutely can perform a minimally invasive tenotomy because there's nothing else different uh, when you get the needle there other than depressing your foot on a foot pedal, uh, at least to start doing the procedure. Uh, after you feel pretty good at understanding what tissue looks like, going back and, and viewing uh, one of the other webinars uh, that's uh, entitled uh, tenonopathy classification, you'll have a better understanding of why we approach type three and type four tendinopathies with minimally invasive uh, tenotomy, uh, just because it, it, it has that presence of degenerative tissue, that mucinous degenerative tissue that we're trying to debris. That is the whole point of uh, MIT, minimally invasive uh, tenotomy. Hyperemia, uh, you can see that again in the other presentation, the neovascularization, that big power Doppler bright signal. When you see that on a tendon, uh, and it's devoid of tendinosis, there's no tendinosis that's there, there's probably some other ways to approach that instead of using minimally invasive tenotomy. But you're still gonna take care of quite a few patients who have tendinosis and have a large amount of hyperemia. Uh, a lot of times that's what brings them into the office. They've had tendinosis for years. They know that they've had, you know, what they'll say, quote unquote, elbow problems in the uh, past, but now they have an acute flare up of that. Uh, we used to, you know, try to take that uh, hyperemia down in different ways, uh, different types of injections, prolonged therapy, and eventually uh, you just have to end up doing the procedure. Uh, and so what we did find out was if you do a tenotomy, uh, minimally invasive tenotomy on a tendon that has hyperemia, you can just expect that it's going to take longer to recover. And it makes sense. You, you have tissue that might be a little bit more friable, but just needs some more time to relax. So we'll tell somebody at the outset, you know, with the amount of hyperemia you have, and this is the conversation we have in the office, with the amount of hyperemia you have, you might expect that this is gonna take a little bit longer to get better. However, uh, we have not seen people have decreased rates of response. We still see people respond well. It's just that they typically take a little bit longer than somebody who doesn't have that hyperemia. Corticosteroid injections. Uh, we don't perform a lot of these in the office for common extensor tendinopathy only because we don't feel that it's a true inflammatory tendinopathy, right? We're debriding degenerative tissue. If somebody comes into the office, we've never met before, their elbow's acutely inflamed, they tell us that they had an injection a year ago, they're just looking to try to get back to their golf season this year, we may talk about doing a corticosteroid injection uh, to try to help out some of their pain, especially if they don't want to move forward with a minimally invasive tenotomy right now. They might want to wait to the end of golf season, but we will tell them if we put a corticosteroid in this area, we are going to wait probably about three months before we'll want to do the procedure. Uh, again, part of it is we just don't know what steroid really does to tendons. I don't think there's any great research out there that helps us to know, is it truly degenerative? A lot of it depends on if it's ultrasound guided, if we know where that needle is. But at the end of the day, anything that's going to impair healing in that area, uh, we, we're certainly going to want to wait 
before moving forward with procedure that's going to be predicated on the fact that you're going to need to heal from it. So we will have them wait about three months. Uh, in terms of just practice management, a uh, separate procedure day for having MITs is great. We take a look, we evaluate patients throughout the week, we'll see them back from their ultrasounds. Uh, I set up a Friday uh, that all I do is minimally invasive synonymy. We'll set up anywhere between uh, eight to uh, 10 procedures. Uh, we rehearsed with our staff before we ever started doing this, so we knew how the procedure was done. You know, I'm not a orthopedic surgeon, so I don't have a uh, the kind of mentality of approaching uh, things like an operation. So we went through and, and planned it exactly like that. Uh, we knew where all of the supplies were going to be. We walked through the entire procedure uh, together. Uh, we pretty much scheduled 45 minute time slots, give enough time to clean the room, uh, turn the room. We do this in a certified procedure room, so it's not in an OR. Uh, we have a nurse who helps us out uh, kind of circulating in, inside there, setting up things. My medical assistant is essentially kind of my first assist with handing me uh, things. And then we normally have a fellow or resident who's in there with us. But having a separate day makes it easy so that you have the time that you need uh, for the entire procedure. Uh, work tightly with your orthopedic surgical colleagues in your PT group, right? Uh, orthopedic surgical colleagues for getting patients in. Explain to them what it is you're doing, why you examine tendons the way that you do what it is that you're gonna be able to offer their uh, patients. I, I think the easiest thing in terms of getting patients to your office is meet with your surgical colleagues and ask them what conditions are the most frustrating for them to take care of. Most shoulder upper extremity surgeons are gonna say chronic tendinopathy, right? Bursitis, uh, impingement of the shoulder, uh, tennis elbow uh, for your lower extremity uh, surgeons, gluteal tendinopathy, hamstring tendinopathy, plantar fasciopathy, Achilles, right? I mean, these, these are things that unless they're acutely ruptured, most of our orthopedic surgical colleagues are gonna go in and do an open debridement or an arthroscopic debridement of the tissue. And when you show them that you can easily localize the tissue under ultrasound, you can reach it with a device like this. It's a less invasive procedure that takes less time and involves less recovery. It's a nice add-on to their practice. And for the way that we work up at uh, the Cleveland Clinic uh, for tennis elbow, I, there's not too many surgeons who uh, will directly operate on that as their uh, first step, <coughs> excuse me, especially when they know uh, the access and how we evaluate these type of things and the post-procedure protocol that we go through, uh, which will be available in another uh, webinar as well. And that focuses more on the physical therapy group, right? So before you get the patients working with your orthopedic colleagues and then afterwards, having a physical therapy group that is invested in tendinopathy, who understands and who likes uh, treating tendinopathy. Uh, you might need to find the right group uh, that, that you can speak to uh, with it. Uh, this is a surgery, this is a procedure, this is an operation, but again, it's minimally invasive. So you want somebody who's not going to put too many conservative guidelines on the patient, we, we do want to get them moving again and get that loaded up. But you also don't want somebody who's gonna say, oh, you didn't have too much done, so let's go ahead and push this. You have to have somebody who's going to approach the care of your patient in the same way that you're approaching their diagnosis and treatment. Uh, we do a hydro dissection uh, with every single procedure. While we're anesthetizing, uh, we also go in and we'll break up the overlying fascia on just about any tendons uh, that are there. There's a couple of uh, very, specific areas like the very proximal patellar tendon where there's uh, you know a bit of fat and, and fascia that should, should be attached there. But certainly as we're going to talk about common extensor tendinopathy, that kind of bilayer fascia that can become very thickened and very adhesed uh, in areas of tendon, we will go in and make sure that that is untethered and not encumbering any type of healing inside that tendon. And this is actually a one of the reasons why people think that injections work in the first place is because it's actually dividing those layers of tissue. A lot of that fascial tissue can be highly innervated and maybe that's a big area of uh, pain that patients are having. So we'll show you a video on uh, how to perform that. A lot of people will ask, how do I know when the procedure is over and what do I do about tears? So we're gonna address both of those while I'm showing you uh, one of the videos because that's probably the best takeaway from when are you done and oh no, I saw a tear, so what am I supposed to do with it? So if we take a look just at patient positioning, uh, we have uh, authority to, to show this picture. This is my medical assistant uh, who uh, posed for this. Uh, so for common extensor tendon, very uh, comfortable position for a patient. Uh, she's lying on her back here, uh, hands are on her belly. Uh, I can take a look with my uh, ultrasound probe right across the elbow here. My area of entry and injection are all gonna be along this line. Very comfortable for me to sit right next to the bed. 
<coughs> and uh, be able to enter right into the common extensor tendon in this area. So very simple setup uh, in positioning for the patient. What we're looking at here is the lateral epicondyle. Uh, this is going to end right into the radiocapitellar joint here. You're going to see a very thin line right across here. This delineates the common extensor tendon above and the radiocollateral ligament below. The fascial line is going to be right on top here. So everything underneath this is common extensor tendon. Here's the area of tendinosis in through here. I'm going to play this video here showing the hydrodissection. <coughs> so the injection is here. That needle comes in right underneath the fascia, and you can see it hydrodissect. This is using fluid hydro to dissect and break up uh, the uh, fascial tissue away from here. This is our first step uh, in each of our procedures, and then we'll go directly into the tendon. We'll have this kind of step down fashion of starting at uh, the most superficial uh, tissue and then working our way all the way down, again, staying just north of our radiocollateral ligament uh, here coming back in, ending at the synthesophyte, uh, and then again, coming back in and making sure to hydrodissect any additional uh, little bits of fascia that are, are still there. So uh, pretty comfortable, quick to do uh, under ultrasound, uh, but again, that just re-showing this, this hydrodissection right at the, the first part, really try to address this, this uh, fascia. Um, not hard to, to get used to. As soon as you enter in with any of your anesthetic and you just start to give that little bit of fluid, you'll actually see the, the fascia uh, split open. You can make that uh, area. It also gives you some room to work um, as you're, you're going to go in with the uh, device. So the uh, next image here, same kind of thing. Here's your common extensor uh, tendon here, lateral epicondyle. This is the uh, TenJet device coming in and debriding out uh, the tissue in this area. You'll be able to, to see kind of the same way that we approach is from superficial to the feel, and this is kind of, again, what people ask, how do you know when you're done here? You can't look at just the tissue alone. Uh, sometimes with, with different uh, tissue, everybody looks a little bit different under an ultrasound, but you can see some of the, the, the tissue start to change a little bit of the echo texture. But I'll tell you, anybody who's done, uh, you know, probably over, a couple hundred of these will tell you it, there's a certain feel that you're looking for. You can feel the difference of good, healthy tendon tissue. It, it feels like rubber. It feels like a racket ball that you put this needle through. There's a drag on, on the needle and the device. It's hard to make room. And so you can kind of feel when you're getting up to those areas. When you get into an area of tendinosis, you can see like here, I, I'm just probing the fascia. I'm almost looking for an area of, of tendinosis that I can pop through. And in, in a second, you'll kind of see that device just pops on through uh, the uh, tissue. And that's the, the area of, of softness, that's the uh, tendinosis that you're actually getting into. And then you're passing that device past there. When, and you can continuously move your, your device back and forth. Remember, you're not just staying in the static position, you're panning posteriorly and anteriorly and actually getting into this tissue. So you can kind of feel where you're just debriding out. It feels like you're removing this mucinous tissue and you're finding the edges of the tendon that are nice and healthy. And once you feel like you've already reached all of those areas of that mucinous tissue, you remove it. You, you remove the device and that you're, you're done. So I, I, would, I would caution trying to find a quantitative way of, of ending a procedure. I wouldn't look at uh, the tissue. I mean, you certainly can overwork the tissue just like any other tissue. So there's a little bit of caution uh, that, that goes into uh, the, the procedure, but you're essentially done when you're done, but figuring that out, Again, it's, it's a, a lot of hands-on uh, feel of, of what's normal uh, and what's, uh, what's healthy. In terms of tears, uh, this is interesting because if you asked me this uh, five years ago when we started using this, I would say, oh, you should be really, really careful if you're going to uh, treat tears. Um, sometimes you, don't, you can't see the tears until you're actually anesthetizing the tendon. And, and if you ask anybody who's done uh, TenJet and, and, and ask them, have you ever not seen a tear on ultrasound? And then as soon as you started to inject, you saw this tear just blow open. Uh, and it's common. It's not that uncommon. If the tendon is not really inflamed, you may not see that on ultrasound. Uh, so if you go in and you, you see a tear, you know, large tear like this that comes all the way across, uh, this is a patient who still has plenty of tendinosis, right, around the area of tear, um, but they didn't want to go doing an open debridement. Uh, and so they asked, will you do TenJet? And I said, well, sure. Uh, you're aware of the, the potential risk, right, that maybe you might be a little bit at an increased risk of rupture. 
uh, here, and they were very aware. Uh, went in and did 10 jet, and then two years later uh, came back and said, you know, I'm still having uh, pain uh, over on the outside of the elbow. It's nowhere near like it was before. Uh, he had some fascial thickening, which we ended up uh, dissecting, but we were able to get a pre and post uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, and what I don't have here, we, we have full cine loops that look across this whole tendon. So this isn't just a representative picture. We couldn't find the tear uh, again. Uh, and so it was probably this uh, case that allowed us to start saying, by no means are we saying that TenJet is a reparative mechanism for the tear, but am I as afraid of tendon ruptures now as I used to be then? Not just because of this case, but I mean, we treated close to a thousand patients at this point, and you expect to have some tears. I mean, we treat patellar tendons and Achilles tendons. Uh, and I'll tell you, I mean, knock on wood, if you can hear that through uh, the webinar, uh, we, we have not had a single rupture. And, and we're not really sure why, right? Some of it might be because of how we immobilize patients afterwards with lower extremity. Maybe it's how we are conservative with our therapy and we have some uh, pretty nicely laid out uh, post-procedural uh, therapy guidelines, uh, which we'll be talking about in another webinar. But there has to be something to the fact that you were not actually cutting through the tissue. And maybe by debriding out this degenerative tissue and introducing this needle through this tissue, we may be signaling some type of reparative mechanism. We're way too early to really be able to totally understand that, but it's, it's curious enough to see images like this and then have patients come back who've had some really significant tendinosis that we know we had to have debrided out some a good amount of tissue, uh, and they haven't had these ruptures and they're getting back to their activity. Uh, and so that, that's how I normally counsel patients and when people ask me about uh, treating uh, minimally invasive tenotomy uh, with tears. So uh, hopefully uh, this uh, presentation has offered you some helpful tips uh, regarding minimally invasive tenotomy. Uh, the best way to learn more, honestly, is, is get your hands on the device, get a feel for the procedure yourself. I know that was the best education for me. Uh, we welcome your feedback uh, regarding this presentation, and we look forward to answering uh, any questions that you might have in the future. Uh, so thank you very much for your time.